Kinski. Hi. <laughs> uh, well, let me begin with uh, two recent events, both of them widely publicized. Uh, the first has to do with uh, the famous Salman Rushdie case. Uh, a couple of days ago, you may have noticed, the Prime Minister of Iran uh, suggested a very simple way to uh, resolve the crisis concerning Rushdie. Uh, he, su he suggested that uh, what should happen is that all the copies of his book, Satanic Verses, should simply be burned. Uh, and I guess the implication is that if that happened, then they could cancel the death sentence. Uh, that's one case, lots of coverage. Uh, second case had to do with an interesting thing that happened here. Uh, there was a, what some people are calling a mega merger uh, of two media giants, uh, Time Incorporated and uh, Warner Communications Incorporated, each of them huge conglomerates, uh, and putting coming together, they form apparently the biggest world, the world's biggest media empire. Now that also had a lot of publicity, even outside the business pages, and there was concern over the effects of the merger uh, uh, by increasing media concentration so effectively, uh, the effects on freedom of expression. Well, these two events are they seem rather remote from one another, and in a sense they are, but we can draw them together by recalling an event which was not considered important enough to be reported, uh, but which I happen to know about because I was personally involved. The uh, title for this talk is, you may have noticed, Manufacturing Consent, Political Economy, the Mass Media. That's actually the title of a recent book uh, that I was co-author of with my co-author is Edward Herman. And the two of us have been working together for many years. Uh, we, the first, our first book was published in 1974, a uh, book on American foreign policy and the media, in fact. Uh, and it was published by a publisher, a textbook publisher, a flourishing textbook publisher, which happened to be a subsidiary of uh, Warner Communications uh, Incorporated. Well, uh, unless you're a very rare person, you never saw that book. And the reason was that when the advertising for the book appeared uh, after 20,000 copies were published. Uh, one of the executives of Warner Communications saw the advertising and didn't like the feel of it and asked to see the book and liked it even less, in fact, was appalled. Uh, and then f followed a, uh, <clears throat> an interaction which I won't bother describing, but the end result of it was that the parent company, Warner Communication, simply decided to put the publisher out of business. Uh, and to end the whole story that way. Now, uh, they didn't uh, burn the books. They pulped them, uh, and it, which is more civilized. Also, books don't burn very well, actually, I'm told. Uh, they're kind of like bricks, uh, but pulping works. Uh, and it wasn't just our book that was eliminated. It was all the books published by that publisher. Uh, well, there are a couple of differences between this and the case of the prime minister of Iran. Uh, one difference is that this was actually done, not just suggested. Uh, uh, the uh, second difference is it wasn't just one book, it was all books which happened to be tainted by being published by the publisher who had uh, done this bad thing. Uh, a third difference is the reaction. Uh, the reaction in the case of uh, the Warner Communications putting the publisher out of business to prevent them from publishing our book uh, the reaction to that was zero, not because it wasn't known, it just was not considered of any significance, uh, whereas the Rushdie affair, of course, has had a huge furor, as it should, uh, and the prime minister's proposal was uh, greeted with uh, ridicule and contempt as a demonstration of what you can expect from these barbarous people. So there are some differences. Well, let's go back to the question about the mega-merger. Uh, would the, will this new um, uh, media empire restrict uh, freedom of expression by excessive media concentration? Possibly, but the 
marginal difference is slight, uh, given what already exists, uh, as is perhaps illustrated by this case. Uh, this is incidentally not the only case, far from the only case, which illustrates how uh, hypocritical and uh, cynical the uh, uh, reaction to the Rushdie affair is. The reaction is legitimate, but we can ask the question whether it's principled or not. And if we look, I think we find that it's not. Well, actually, this whole story that I've just told is kind of misleading. It's accurate in identifying the locus of decision-making power, uh, not only in publishing and in the media, but in political life and in social life generally. In that respect, it's accurate. But it's very misleading with regard to how that power is typically exercised. This is a very unusual case. I wouldn't want to suggest that this is what happens typically. Uh, it's usually much more subtle than this, uh, but no less effective. And now I'm going to come back to some of the more subtle ways and the reasons for them. Uh, and in fact, if there's time or maybe back in discussion, I'll talk about the aftermath of this particular incident, which is also kind of illuminating in this respect, though more complex. Well, with that much as background, let me turn to the main topic, uh, manufacturing consent, uh, a strange uh, a topic, uh, 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 and thought control and indoctrination and so on. Uh, now, there's a, and, and I want to discuss how this relates to the, to the media. Now, there is a standard view about the media and the way they function. The standard view is expressed, for example, by Supreme Court Justice Powell when he describes what he calls the crucial role of the media in affecting the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is, enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process. So the idea is this is kind of an instrumental defense of the First Amendment. The value to be achieved is the democratic process, and for the democratic process to function, uh, it's necessary for the public to have free access, open access to relevant information and opinion, and a wide range of opinion, uh, and it's the job of the media to uh, ensure that, and the First Amendment has the instrumental function of guaranteeing that this is served and the media then do it. That's the standard view. Uh, and notice it has a kind of a descriptive component and also a normative component. It says this is what the media ought to be like and this is what they are like. Now, that they ought to be this way seems sort of obvious, in fact, kind of almost tautological if democracy means has something to do with the public having a capacity to shape their own affairs. It obviously presupposes information, and that means the information system in a free society would have to serve this function. Uh, since it seems so obvious, it's worth bearing in mind that there is a contrary view. And in fact, the contrary view is very widely held. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the contrary view is the dominant view among people over the last couple of centuries who have thought about liberal democracy and freedom and how it ought to function. In any event, it's certainly a major position. Uh, this contrary view can be traced back to the origins of modern democracy in the 17th century English Revolution when for the first time uh, the, the, there was a challenge to the right of authority, uh, uh, whether it was the gentry or the, the king or whatever, uh, and uh, there was actually the beginnings of a real radical democratic movement uh, with uh, uh, a commitment on the part of the people involved who were very widespread in England to uh, public involvement and control over affairs. They didn't want to be ruled by the king. They didn't want to be ruled by parliament. They wanted to run their own affairs. Uh, and they were defeated. The radical Democrats were defeated, but not before doing some important things which had a lasting effect. Well, st st what I'm interested in now is the reaction to this. Uh, the reaction to the first efforts at popular democracy, radical democracy, you might call it, were uh, a good deal of fear and concern. Uh, one uh, historian of the time, Clement Walker, uh, warned that these guys who were running, putting out pamphlets on their little printing presses and uh, uh, distributing them and uh, agitating in the army and you know, telling people how the system really worked were having an extremely dangerous effect. They were revealing the mysteries of government. And he said, that's dangerous because it will, I'm quoting him, it will make people so curious and so arrogant that they will never find humility enough to submit to a civil rule. And that's a problem. Uh, John Locke, a couple of years later, uh, explained what the problem was. He said, day laborers and tradesmen, uh, the 
spinsters and the dairymaids must be told what to believe. The greater part cannot know, and therefore they must believe. Uh, and of course, someone must tell them what to believe. Now, there's a modern version of that, and of course he didn't just mean those categories, he meant the general public. Uh, there's a modern version of that. This goes all the way up to the mo modern times, it's discussed in the American Revolution and all the way through to the modern period, but let's just come up to the contemporary period. Uh, now, uh, in, in, last, in, in the modern period, you get uh, a much more sophisticated development of these ideas. So, for example, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's a much respected moralist and commentator on world affairs. Uh, he wrote that rationality belongs to the cool observers, but because of the stupidity of the average man, he follows not reason, but faith. And uh, this naive faith requires uh, that necessary illusions be developed, emotionally potent oversimplifications uh, have to be provided by the myth makers to keep the ordinary person on course because of the stupidity of the average man. That's the same view, basically. Uh, Walter Lippmann, who was the dean of American journalists, is the man who invented the phrase manufacture of consent. Uh, he described the manufacture of consent as a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government. This, he said, is quite important. This is a revolution in the practice of democracy and he thought it was a worthwhile revolution. The reason is, again, the stupidity of the average man. Uh, the common interests, he said, uh, very largely elude public opinion entirely, and they can be managed only by a specialized class whose personal interests reach beyond the locality. That's Niebuhr's cool observers. Uh, you can guess who's part of them. The, the person who pr pr pronounces these views is always part of that group. It's the others who aren't. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is in uh, Walter Lippmann's book, Public Opinion, which appeared shortly after World War I, and the timing is important. Uh, World War I uh, was a period in which the liberal intellectuals, John Dewey's circle primarily, uh, were quite impressed with themselves for their success, uh, as they described in their own words, for their success in having imposed their will upon a reluctant or indifferent majority. Now, there was a problem in World War I. The problem was that the population was, as usual, pacifistic and didn't see any particular reason in going out and killing Germans and getting killed. Uh, if the Europeans want to do that, that's their business. Uh, and in fact, uh, Woodrow Wilson won the 1916 election uh, on a mandate which was uh, peace without victory. That's how he got elected. And not surprisingly, he interpreted that as meaning victory without peace. And the problem was to get this uh, reluctant and indifferent majority and get them to be, uh, uh, to create emotionally potent oversimplifications and uh, uh, necessary illusions uh, so that they would then be properly jingoistic uh, and support this great cause. And the liberal intellectuals were convinced that they were the ones who had primarily succeeded in doing this and they thought it was a very good a task for obvious reasons, uh, and in fact, uh, they pr probably had some role, whether they had as much role as they think you could question, but some role, uh, they used uh, all sorts of necessary illusions. For example, fabrications about Hun atrocities, uh, Belgian babies with their arms torn off, and all sorts of things that were concocted by the British Foreign Service and fed to the educated classes in the United States who picked them up and were quite enthusiastic about them and distributed them. Uh, they uh, 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 used such devices as uh, what they called historical engineering. Uh, there was a phrase uh, proposed by Frederick Paxson, an American historian, who was the founder of a group called the National Board for Historical Service. That was a group of historians who got together to serve the state by explaining the issues of the war that we might better win it. That's historical engineering. The Wilson administration established uh, the country's, I think, first official propaganda agency. It was called the Creel Commission, uh, which was dedicated to uh, convincing this reluctant or indifferent majority that they'd better be properly enthusiastic about the war that they were opposed to. Uh, the, uh, that, uh, that had some institutional consequences. In fact, there were a number of institutional consequences to this whole period. One was the institution of the National Political Police, the FBI, 
which has been dedicated to thought control and repression of freedom ever since. That's its primary activity. Uh, and another development, institutional development, was the enormous growth of the public relations industry. A lot of people learned lessons from the capacity to control, to control the public mind, as they put it, uh, slogan of the public relations industry. Uh, one of the people who came out of the Creel Commission was a man named Edward Bernays, who became the patron saint of the public relations industry. That's a big, substantial industry, which is actually an American creation, though it's since spread throughout other parts of the world. It's dedicated to controlling the public mind, uh, again, quoting its publications, to educate the American people about the economic facts of life, to ensure a favorable climate for business, and, of course, a proper understanding of the common interests. Uh, Bernays developed the concept of engineering of consent, which he said is the essence of democracy. Uh, that's, uh, and of course, didn't bother saying that there are only some groups who are in a position to carry out the engineering of consent, those who have the power and the resources. Uh, he himself uh, uh, showed how this was done often by, for example, uh, uh, demonizing the government of Guatemala, the capitalist democratic government that we were planning to overthrow with a successful CIA coup. He was then working for the United Fruit Company, which was opposed to the government because it was planning to uh, uh, take over unused lands of the United Fruit Company and hand them over to landless peasants, paying the rates that the United Fruit Company had given as their value. Uh, for tax purposes, which of course they regarded as very unfair because they had naturally been lying and cheating about the value. Uh, so that was uh, his achievement and that, in fact the public relations industry in general has been dedicated to this project ever since. The Creel Commission incidentally is a predecessor of a contemporary uh, uh, phenomenon that the Reagan administration uh, constructed. It's their Office of Latin American Public Diplomacy. That's by far the largest propaganda agency in American history, maybe one of the largest of any Western government. Uh, and uh, it was also dedicated to controlling the public mind. It was dedicated primarily to controlling the debate and discussion over Central America, to demonizing the Sandinistas, as one of its officials put it, and mobilizing support for the U.S. terror states in the region. Uh, and uh, it uh, did it by framing the debate by intimidating critics, by uh, uh, producing uh, fabrications which were then happily repeated by the media. And so, for example, one famous one just to illustrate some of its achievements. Uh, when Ronald Reagan in uh, 1986 uh, read a spectacular and effective speech uh, which convinced Congress to vote $100 million of aid for the Contras uh, right after the World Court had denounced the United, had condemned the United States for the unlawful use of force and called upon it to end this aggression. Uh, this speech was extremely effective. It, uh, it described all the you know, whole litany of Nicaraguan crimes. And it ended up by saying that these communists actually concede that they are planning to conquer the hemisphere and undermine us all. Uh, they themselves say that uh, they are carrying out a revolution without borders. That was the peroration. That's the way he ended up. You know, big excitement. Uh, Congress voted the aid. Uh, the Reagan administration uh, declared that uh, uh, this, this meant war. This was a real war, and everybody was excited and happy. Now, that phrase, revolution without borders, uh, actually had already been used. It had been used by a State Department pamphlet. Uh, uh, it was called Revolution Without Borders, describing Sandinista crimes. And uh, there's actually a version of that phrase that exists. The phrase uh, is, is a, appears, or something like it appears, in a speech by uh, Sandinista Comandante Thomas Borges. Uh, he had given a speech in which he said that the Nicaraguan, the Sandinistas, hope to construct a kind of a model society, a society which will, be, uh, which will work so well and will serve the needs of the poor so well that others will be uh, uh, inclined to try to do the same thing for themselves. And he went on to say there, that every country, has to, every country has to carry out its own revolution. There's no way for one country to make a revolution somewhere else. But uh, the model that the Sandinistas are constructing, he hoped would be so successful that others would want to do it. And he said, in this sense, our revolution transcends borders. 
Well, that phrase was immediately picked up by the Office of Public Diplomacy and turned into a threat to conquer the hemisphere. Uh, that fraud was at once exposed by the uh, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, which sends out a weekly news analysis in Washington that journalists read. It was even, expo it was even mentioned in the Washington Post, somewhere in the back pages. Uh, they noted that the phrase revolution without borders was not exactly what he had said. In fact, sort of nothing to do with the opposite of what he had said. But that didn't make any difference. Uh, the phrase was useful. The construction was useful. And since then, the media, ha and, and when the State Department document came out, there was no criticism of it. When Reagan made the speech, nobody pointed out that this was a fabrication. Even the Washington Post, which had exposed it, referred to the Sandinista Revolution Without Borders. Uh, the media have repeatedly, have repeated this over and over again. Look, they say themselves that they're going to have a revolution without borders and so on. Well, that's the kind of thing that's done by an effective propaganda agency, of course, if the media are willing to go along, because it wasn't very hard to figure out that this was an uh, incredible fraud. Uh, well, that's the kind of thing that was done. All of these operations were completely illegal. Uh, there was a congressional report done on them, general uh, GAO report, uh, uh, which pointed out that, of course, they were illegal. They were run out of the National Security Council and not allowed to propagandize Americans. But it was very successful. When this was exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings, uh, one top administration official described the activities of the Office of Public Diplomacy as one of their really great achievements. It was, a, he said, a spectacular success. Uh, he described it as the kind of operation that you carry out in enemy territory. And that's quite an appropriate phrase. I think the phrase expresses exactly uh, the way in which the public is viewed by people with power. It's an enemy. It's a domestic enemy. And you've got to keep it under control. And you have to make sure that the mysteries are not revealed uh, so that the people don't become so curious and arrogant that they refuse to submit to a civil rule, uh, to put it in 17th century terms. And to control that domestic enemy, propaganda and fabrications and so on are uh, important. And that's what the public relations industry is for, for corporate purposes, uh, and what, uh, what the media are for if they properly serve the state. Well, that's, uh, notice again, we have a, a view that says the media should not function the way uh, the standard rhetoric claims. There's also an academic twist to this. It's come closer to home. Uh, if you go back to uh, the uh, International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences, published in 1933, days when people were a little more open and honest in what they said, uh, there's an article on propaganda. And it's well worth reading. There's an entry under propaganda. Uh, the entry is written by a leading, one, maybe the leading American political scientist, uh, Harold Laswell, who was very influential, particularly in this area, communications and so on. And in this entry in the International Encyclopedia on Propaganda, he says, uh, we should not succumb to democratic dogmatisms about men being the best judges of their own interests. Uh, they are not. He said, even with the rise of mass education, doesn't mean that people can judge their own interests. They can't. The best judges of their interests are elites, the specialized class, the cool observers, uh, the people who have rationality. And therefore, they must be granted the means to impose their will. Notice, for the common good. Because again, because, uh, well, he says, uh, because of the ignorance and superstition of the masses, uh, he said it's necessary to have a whole new technique of control, largely through propaganda. Propaganda, he says, we shouldn't have a negative connotation about it. It's neutral. Propaganda, he says, is as neutral as a pump handle. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. Since we're good people, obviously, that's sort of true by definition. Uh, we'll use it for good purposes, and there should be no negative connotations about that. In fact, it's moral to use it, because that's the only way that you can uh, save the ignorant and stupid masses of the population from their own errors. You don't let a three-year-old run across the street and you don't let ordinary people make their own decisions. Uh, you have to control them. And why do you need propaganda? Well, he explains that. Uh, he says in military-run or feudal societies, what we would these days call totalitarian societies, uh, you don't really need propaganda that much. And the reason is you got a, you've got a club in your hand. You can control the way people behave. And therefore, it doesn't matter much what they think. Uh, because if they get out of line, you can control them for their own good, of course. Uh, but once you lose the club, 
you know, once the state loses its capacity to coerce by force, then you have some problems. Uh, the voice of the people is heard. You got all these formal mechanisms around that permit people to express themselves and even participate and vote and that sort of thing. Uh, and you can't control them by force because you lost that capacity. But the voice of the people is heard, and therefore you got to make sure it says the right thing. And in order to make sure it says the right thing, you've got to have effective and sophisticated propaganda, again, for their own good. Uh, so in a, as a society becomes more free, that is, there's less capacity to coerce, it simply needs more sophisticated indoctrination and propaganda for the public good. Uh, the, the, the similarity between this and Leninist ideology is very striking. Uh, according to Leninist ideology, the cool observers, the radical intelligentsia, will be the vanguard who will lead the stupid and ignorant masses onto uh, you know, communist utopia because they're too stupid to work it out by themselves. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's been a very easy transition over these years between one and the other position. You know, it's very striking that continually people move from one position to the other very easily. Uh, and I think the reason for the ease is partly because they're sort of the same position. So you can be either a Marxist-Leninist uh, commissar, or you can be uh, somebody celebrating the magnificence of uh, state capitalism, and you can serve those guys. Uh, it's more or less the same position. Uh, you pick one or the other depending on your estimate of where power is, and that can change. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the mainstream of the intelligentsia, I think, over the last, say, through this century, have tended to be in one or the other camp. Either there's a strong appeal of Marxism-Leninism to the intelligentsia for obvious reasons. I don't have to bother saying. Uh, and there's the same appeal of these doctrines to the intelligentsia uh, because it puts them in the position of, justify, of having a justified role as ideological managers in the service of real power, corporate and state power, uh, for the public good, of course. So you naturally are tempted to one or the other position. Uh, well, going on to the post-Second World, Second World War period, the same ideas continue to be expressed. Uh, for example, in 1948, when it was again necessary to uh, drive the reluctant and indifferent majority to a new war fever. Remember, 1948, the war was over. Everybody was pacifistic. They wanted to go home and buy refrigerators and so on. And they didn't want any more wars. They wanted to demobilize. We were done with that stuff. But they had to be whipped up into a war fever because there was a new war coming along. Uh, the Cold War, which was a real war, as, uh, uh, as the internal documents explain, uh, and it was necessary to uh, uh, bludgeon uh, them into uh, uh, belief in the uh, demands of the Cold War, as Dean Acheson put it. Uh, the, a presidential, well-known historian, presidential historian Thomas Bailey, explained in 1948 that because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger, until it is at their throats, our, state, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact be incre become increasingly necessary unless we are willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. In other words, if we continue this nonsense of trying to control them through elections and that sort of thing, it's going to be necessary to have deception of the people. Uh, because the masses are too stupid and ignorant to understand the danger that's at their throat. And that's the role of the media, to carry out the appropriate deception. Uh, coming up to the present, or near present, in 1981, when we were launching a new crusade for freedom in Central America, uh, Samuel Huntington, who was a professor of government at Harvard and a longtime government advisor, uh, explained in a discussion in the Harvard Journal International Security that... Uh, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union you're fighting. That's what the United States has done ever since the Truman Doctrine. And that's what, of course, we're now doing. We're fighting Nicaragua, but we've got to create the misimpression that it's the uh, Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's the job of the Office of Latin American Public Diplomacy and of the cool observers and of respectable intellectuals and of the media and so on. Actually, that remark of his is quite accurate and gives a certain insight into the Cold War and also the modern period. Well, uh, these concerns about controlling the public mind, rather typically they, ar they arise in the wake of periods of war and turmoil. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, wars and depressions and such things, they have a way of 
arousing people from apathy and making them think uh, and sometimes even organize. And that raises all of these dangers. Uh, so, for example, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, a very harsh and effective repression, immediately followed World War I. And that's when uh, you get the, this revolution in the art of democracy about the need for manufacture of consent. And you get uh, the FBI to uh, really do the job properly by force, if necessary, as they did. Uh, McCarthy, what we call McCarthyism, which is a poor label because it was actually initiated by the liberal Democrats in the late 1940s and picked up and exploited by McCarthy. But what we call McCarthyism uh, was a similar effort to, to overcome uh, the, uh, the energizing effect of the war and the depression in mobilizing the population and causing them to challenge, the, to reveal the mysteries of government and do all these bad things. And after the Vietnam War, the same thing happened. Uh, the Vietnam War was one factor, a major factor, in fact, in causing the ferment of the 1960s. And that caused a lot of concern, deep concern, which still exists, incidentally, because they haven't been able to overcome it. Uh, the Vietnam, the, the 60s created what liberal elites called a crisis of democracy. That's the title of a quite important book uh, on all of these topics. Uh, the first, um, and in fact only book length publication of the Trilateral Commission, uh, published in 1975, called The Crisis of Democracy. It's about the problem of governability of democracies. And there was a problem of the governability of democracies because people were getting out of hand. The domestic enemy was getting out of control and something had to be done about it. Uh, the Trilateral Commission it puts together liberal corporate and state elites from the three major uh, centers of state capitalism, Western Europe, the United States, and Japan. That's why the trilateral. And it is the liberal elites. This is the group around Jimmy Carter. It's where he came from, in fact, and virtually all of his cabinet and top advisors. It's that segment of opinion. Uh, the American uh, uh, rapporteur, the guy who gave the report the, for the United States, was again Samuel Huntington. And he uh, pointed out that uh, Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. Uh, then there was no crisis of democracy. That's the way things were supposed to be. And so this kind of vulgar Marxist rhetoric is not untypical of internal documents uh, in the government or in the business press and so on. And this was intended to be an internal document. They didn't really expect people to read it. Uh, but it's worth reading. I'm sure the library has it. They should. Uh, the, uh, uh, this, but, but now this crisis of democracy had erupted. Uh, what had happened was during the 1960s, all sorts of segments of the population that are normally apathetic and passive and obedient and don't get in the way, uh, sudden began, began to become organized and vocal and raise questions and press their demands in the political arena. Uh, and that caused a, an overload. It caused a crisis of democracy. You couldn't just govern the country with a few Wall Street lawyers and bankers any longer. You had all these other pressures coming from the general population. Uh, and that's a problem. And we got to overcome the problem. And the way to overcome the problem, they said, all three, the, the whole group, is to uh, uh, introduce more moderation in democracy to mitigate the uh, uh, excess of democracy. That means, in short, to return the general population to their uh, apathy and passivity uh, and the obedience which becomes them. That's the stupid and ignorant masses have to be kept out of trouble. Uh, and when you get these crises of democracy, you've got to restore the norm that we had before. Uh, well, that's a view that goes right back to the origins of the republic. If you read the sayings of the founding fathers, uh, you will discover that that was essentially their view as well. Uh, they also regarded the public as a dangerous threat uh, the way the country ought to be organized, uh, as John Jay put it, the president of the Constitutional Convention and the first Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, his, one of his favorite maxims, according to his biographer, was that those who, run, who, those who own the country ought to govern it. Uh, and if they can't govern it by force, uh, they've got to govern it in another way, and that ultimately requires a deception, propaganda, indoctrination. Uh, the manufacture of consent. Well, let me summarize. There's a standard view, rhetorical view. The standard view in rhetoric is 
basically that of Justice Powell. Uh, the public ought to exert meaningful control over the political process, and it's the role of the media to allow them to do it. That's the rhetoric. There's a contrary view, which is that the public is a dangerous enemy, uh, and it has to be controlled for its own good. And that contrary view is very widely held. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the dominant view among sophisticated commentators on political theory going back to the 17th century, democratic commentators. So we got these two views counterposed. Well, with regard to the media, turning to the media, the standard view is, again, the one I just described by Justice Powell. They have to, the media have to serve, they're going to serve the societal purpose of the First Amendment, they have to be free and open and so on. And then the descriptive part of that is that that's exactly what they do. Uh, that view is expressed, for example, by Judge Gerfine in, in an important case where he permitted the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers in 1971 or two. Uh, Gerfine's decision says that we have a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press, uh, and it must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. So granted, the press is a nuisance, but it's important to allow it to maintain its adversarial and cantankerous ways because it's even, you know, it serves an even higher purpose. Well, at that point, we begin to have a debate. Uh, the debate is between the people who say uh, that the media are cantankerous and adversarial and so on, and they've gone too far. Uh, we got to do something to control them and constrain them. In fact, the Trilateral Commission liberals also suggested that. Uh, they said the media have gone much too far in their adversarial ways, uh, and we have to, uh, if they can't regulate themselves, probably the government will have to step in and regulate them. Uh, that's on the liberal side. On the reactionary side, of course, it's much harder. You know, harsher ideas come along. Uh, so you have, uh, so you have that, you, the one side says that, we've got to curb the press, they're too cantankerous, and then you've got uh, the spokesman for free speech, Judge Gerfine, and so on, they say, no, no, it's, we agree, they're pretty bad, but uh, uh, you've got to allow them to do this because of the higher uh, purposes. Well, that's the debate. Uh, and if you look over, th there is a good deal of discussion of the media, and that's the, f that's the way it's framed. Assumption, the media have, are, are adversarial, cantankerous, independent, uh, and, then the, and maybe even so much that they're threatening democracy. And then comes the question, should we let them get away with it, or should we curb them? And the advocates of free speech say, sorry, you've got to let them get away with it. And the others say, no, there's other values that are more important, like the governability of the country and so on, so we've got to stop them. Well, outside the spectrum of debate, there's another view. Uh, the other view says that the factual assumption is wrong. Uh, the factual assumption is taken for granted, not even argued, is just wrong. According to this alternative view, the media do fulfill a societal purpose, but it's quite a different one. Uh, the societal purpose is uh, exactly what is advocated by the elite view that I've described. The society inculcate and defend the economic and social and political agenda of particular sectors privileged groups that dominate the domestic society, uh, those that own the society and therefore ought to govern it. And they do this in all kinds of ways. They do it by selection of topics, by distribution of concerns, by the way they frame issues, by the way they filter information, by the way they tell lies, like about revolutions without borders, uh, by emphasis and tone, uh, all sorts of ways, the most crucial of which is just the bounding of debate. What they do is say, Here's the spectrum of permissible debate, and within that you can have a, you know, a great controversy, but you can't go outside it. Uh, the uh, right wing continually claims that the press has a liberal bias, and there's some truth to that, uh, but they don't understand what it means. The liberal bias is extremely important in a, system of pro in a, f in a sophisticated system of propaganda. In fact, there ought to be a liberal bias. The liberal bias says, thus far and no further. I'm as far as you can go, and look how liberal I am. And of course, it turns out that I accept without question all the presuppositions of the propaganda system. Notice that that's a b beautiful type of system. You don't ever express the propaganda. That's vulgar and too easy to penetrate. You just presuppose it. Unless you accept the presuppositions, you're not part of the discussion. And the presuppositions are instilled not by beating, them, beating you over the head with them, but just by making them the foundation of discussion. 
you don't accept them, you're not in the discussion. So in the case of, the, say, the Vietnam War, which was you know, a major topic of debate, if you look over the media, there was a big debate over the Vietnam War. There were the hawks who said that if we continue to fight harder and we're more violent and so on and so forth, then we can achieve the noble end of defending South Vietnam and the free people of South Vietnam from communism. And then there were the doves who said it's probably not going to work and it's probably not going to be too, it's going to be too bloody and it's going to cost us too much uh, and therefore we're not going to be able to achieve the noble end of uh, defending the people of South Vietnam from communism. Now again, there's another view and that is that we were attacking South Vietnam. And that other view has the merit of being true, obviously true, but it was inexpressible. That's outside the spectrum of debate. You can enter the debate only if you accept the assumption and if you check the media over the entire period, as far as I can see, I've, uh, Herman and I in this book review the media from about 1950 to the present on Indochina, and I don't think you can find an exception to this. I mean, even statistical error. That's the spectrum, you've got to accept it. And the same is true, and uh, there's a liberal bias in the sense that towards the end of the war, like by about 1969 or 1970, after Wall Street had turned against the war, then uh, you got a preponderance of doves saying, probably aren't going to succeed in defending freedom and democracy in South Vietnam, the country that we're attacking. Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, uh, this, this, this conception of the media, which notice challenges the factual assumptions of the entire debate, uh, that says that the media function in the way that Herman and I called the propaganda model in this same book. Uh, they function in accord with a propaganda model. Now, propaganda sounds like a bad word, but remember that in more honest days, like in the International Encyclopedia of Social Science, propaganda was considered a perfectly good word, and in fact, something that we ought to have more of it, uh, because it's needed for the reasons that Laswell explained. Well, notice that the propaganda model has uh, lots of predictions. It predicts the way the media are going to behave, and you can test those predictions, but it also has a prediction of, that's kind of reflexive about the propaganda model itself. It predicts that the propaganda model can't be taken seriously. And there's a reason for that, if you think it through. Uh, the propaganda model states that the debate has got to be within assumptions that are serviceable to powerful interests. And the propaganda model challenges those, those assumptions, so therefore it's got to be out of the debate. Okay? Uh, that prediction is incidentally very well confirmed. Uh, it is outside the debate. Uh, so that's one bit of positive evidence for the propaganda model. Uh, notice, incidentally, that this model has a kind of a disconcerting feature to it, if you think about it. Uh, obviously, the claims of the propaganda model are either valid or invalid. If they're invalid, we can dismiss them. If they're valid, we have to dismiss them, right? <laughs> so one way or another, you can be sure that this model isn't going to be discussed. Uh, and that's, in fact, true. Well, now, the basic questions from this point on are factual. Is the factual assumption that bounds the debate correct, or is it wrong? That's a factual assumption, and you can study it. Uh, and the real topic, you know, the topic that ought to be investigated is that. Now, there isn't time to do that now, so I'll just make a couple of comments about it and give a few illustrations. Three comments first. First, notice that the propaganda model has a number of features. One feature that it has is that it's advocated by elites. That's, that is, it's the, it, ex, it conforms with the normative opinion, the proposal that the public is dangerous, You've got, they are, uh, you've got to ensure that they don't get out of control. They have to be controlled by deception and uh, propaganda, since you don't have the means to do it by force. And the propaganda model simply says, well, yeah, they work the way elites say they ought to work. So one point about the propaganda model is that, in fact, uh, it's, it has elite advocacy. A second point about the propaganda model is that it's, it's got a kind of prior plausibility. In fact, it's almost natural on completely uncontroversial assumptions. If you look at the structure of the society, you'd almost predict the propaganda model without even looking at the facts. Why is that true? Well, simply ask yourself what the major media are. Now, the, the way the media work, there are some media which kind of set the agenda, you know, the most important ones, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, the big national media. Uh, they set the agenda. If the government wants a story to get into television, uh, that evening. What it does is leak it to get into the front page of the Washington Post and New York Times on the assumption that television will pick it up and say, okay, that's important, so we'll give it the front news. Uh, the same is true of national television. Uh, it sets, it's, you know, sets the agenda that 
makes people think. Uh, the uh, New York Times front page is sent over the uh, wire services the afternoon of the day before. There's a thing, if you read the, you know, you look at that stuff that's ground out of the AP wire, you'll notice around 4 o'clock comes something that says, uh, the New York Times front page tomorrow is going to look like so-and-so. Uh, well, if you're a, an editor of a journal in some small town, uh, you read it and you say, oh, that's what the important news is. Uh, and you frame your own reporting that way. Now, you know, it's not 100%, uh, but there is a kind of an agenda-setting uh, media. Uh, New York Times, Washington Post, the three television channels, a few others that participate to some extent in this. Well, ask yourself what those institutions are. Answer, those institutions are, first of all, major corporations, some of the biggest corporations in the country. Furthermore, they're integrated with, and in many cases, owned by even larger corporations, you know, like General Electric and so on. Uh, so what you have is major corporations and conglomerates. Uh, now, like other corporations, they sell a product to a market. The market, in this case, is advertisers. That's what keeps them alive. Uh, the product is audiences. They sell audiences to advertisers. In fact, for the major media, they try to sell privileged audiences to advertisers. That raises advertising rates, and those are the people they're trying to reach anyway. Uh, so what you have is businesses, corporations, which are selling relatively privileged audiences to other businesses. Well, just ask yourself the natural question, what do you expect to come out of this interaction, major corporations selling privileged audiences to other corporations. Well, what you expect to come out of it on no further assumptions uh, is uh, an interpretation of the world that reflects the interests and the needs of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. That wouldn't be very surprising. In fact, it'd be kind of surprising if it weren't true. So on relative, and that of course means the propaganda model. So what you expect on relatively uncontroversial sort of free market assumptions with nothing else said uh, is that you'll get the media will function in accord with the propaganda model. Now, if you look more closely, there are many other factors which interact to lead to the same expectation. Uh, the ideological managers, uh, the editors and the columnists and the, you know, the uh, anchor men and all that stuff, they're very privileged people. They're wealthy, privileged people. Uh, whose associations and interests and concerns uh, refl are, are closely related to those of the groups that dominate the economy and that dominate the state. And in fact, there's just a constant flow and interaction among all those groups. They're basically the same group. They're ultimately the people who own the country are the ones who serve their interests. And again, it wouldn't be terribly surprising to discover that these people share the perceptions and concerns and feelings and interests and you know, attitudes of their associates and the people they're connected with and the people whose positions they aspire to take when they move on to the next job and so on and so forth. Again, that wouldn't be very surprising. And on and on, I won't proceed. There are many other factors which tend in the same direction. Well, that's my second point. Second point is that the propaganda model has a kind of prior plausibility. A third point, which is not too well known, is that the propaganda model is assumed to be true by most of the public. That is, in polls, contrary to what you hear, it, when, when people are asked in polls, you know, what do you think about the media and so on, the general reaction is they're too conformist, they're too subservient to power, you know, they're too obedient. That's the either plurality or sometimes even majority view. Uh, the, and the, they're not critical enough of government, for example. That's the standard view. Well, we have three observations now. The propaganda model has elite advocacy, that is, elites believe that's the way it ought to be, the, the media ought to be. It has prior plausibility. It's very plausible on uncontroversial free market assumptions. Uh, and it's accepted as valid by a large part, probably the majority of the population. Uh, well, those three facts don't prove that it's valid, of course. But they do suggest that it might be part of the discussion. It's not. Uh, it's off the agenda, exactly as the propaganda model itself predicts. Uh, that's interesting. That's an interesting collection of facts. Well, what about the factual matter of how the media behave? On this, there are by now literally thousands of pages of documentation, detailed documentation, case studies, and so on, which have put the model to, to a test in the harshest ways that anybody can dream up. I'll talk about some of the ways of doing it later. Uh, or, you know, in discussion if you want. 
but I think it's been subjected to quite a fair test, in fact, a very harsh test. There's no challenge to it, as far as I know. Uh, if there is, I've missed it. Uh, the, the few cases where there's any discussion of it, the level of argument is so embarrassingly bad that it just tends to reinforce the plausibility of the model. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that this is one of the best confirmed theses in the social sciences. But in accord with its predictions, it's off the agenda. You can't even discuss it. Well, uh, what I ought to do now is what has to be done in a course, actually, not in a talk, and that is to turn to cases. You know, method, you know, ask how you could test it, what the results are, and so on. And there's plenty of material in print and more coming out uh, in which, which you can check and see whether you're convinced that, in fact, it's plausible or accurate, uh, my feeling is it is. I'll just give a couple of illustrative cases. And let me stress that I do this with some reluctance because the illustrative cases are misleading. Uh, they suggest that maybe it's a sporadic phenomenon. In fact, when somebody gives you a couple of cases, you rightly ask whether they're an adequate sample. You know, maybe they were just selected to work. Uh, so you ought to be suspicious about isolated cases. That's why the model has, in fact, been tested for many approaches. But that misleading necessity aside, because I can't do more than that, let me give you a couple of cases to illustrate the kind of thing I think you will find if you pursue the question of fact. Uh, let's take something that you'd certainly expect the media to be concerned with, namely freedom of press. They got a professional interest in that. And in fact, there's a good deal of discussion of freedom of press in the media. Uh, in the, just keeping just to the last decade, the problems of the press in repressive societies has been very widely discussed, many examples. Uh, the, uh, the case that has been by far the most discussed, in fact, I suspect it has been discussed more than all questions of, media, of freedom of the press throughout the entire world during this period, uh, is the one newspaper in Latin America that 99% of the literate population would be able to name if they were asked to name a newspaper in Latin America, namely La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, there has been an overwhelming uh, amount of reporting on the tribulations of La Prensa in Nicaragua. Uh, one media analyst uh, Francisco Goldman, who studied freedom of the pre press in these countries, pointed out that in four years he found about 260 references to this in the New York Times. That's an incredible amount of coverage. I'm sure, I don't think anybody's done the study, but try it if anybody wants. I'm sure you'll find that this is more coverage than has been given to problems, all other problems of the freedom of press combined all over the world, probably by a considerable factor. Uh, anyhow, that's the one, you know, that's the famous case. Uh, and this coverage has been very irate and angry because of the tribulations of La Prensa. Uh, for example, when, well, let's go back to the moment when Ronald Reagan succeeded in convincing Congress to vote $100 million in aid so that we'd have a war, a real war, in violation of the uh, demand of the world court that the United States consider its uh, stop, terminate its unlawful aggression. Uh, right after that, after uh, the government announced that now we finally got a war, a real war, the government of Nicaragua suspended La Prensa. And that caused tremendous outrage in the United States. Uh, there's a group of, there's a distinguished group of journalism fellows at Harvard, the Neiman Foundation, and they immediately gave their uh, award for the year to Violeta Chamorro, the editor of La Prensa, to express their solidarity with uh, her in this moment of crisis and to show how deeply committed they are to freedom of the press. Uh, the Washington Post had an editorial right after that called Newspaper of Valor, uh, in which they said Violetta Chamorro should receive 10 awards, not one award. Uh, the New York Review of Books had an article by uh, left liberal correspondent Murray Kempton uh, appealing to people to contribute funds to keep uh, the you know, La Prensa alive during this period. Those funds uh, could then be added on to the uh, CIA subvention that had kept the journal going since the Carter administration in 1979, right after the uh, uh, Sandinista revolution succeeded. Uh, and in fact, in general, there was great frenzy and hysteria about this terrible attack on freedom of the press. Well, let's look a little more closely. First of all, what is La Prensa? Uh, La Prensa is a journal which uh, calls for the overthrow of the government of Nicaragua by a foreign power which funds it uh, and which is trying to overthrow the government of Nicaragua. It's an interesting fact. Uh, you might check the history of the West to see whether there's ever been any such thing. 
For example, you might ask whether uh, a major newspaper in the United States, you know, the wealthiest newspaper in the United States, was funded by the Nazis in 1943, uh, calling for the overthrow of the government of the United States. And you might ask yourself, what would have happened if uh, that uh, was possible? Well, you can get the answer very quickly. Uh, even tiny little newspapers, which weren't funded by anybody, and that raised questions about conscientious objection and so on, they were censored and controlled and suppressed and so on. Uh, during the First World War, it was even more vicious. We even actually put a presidential candidate in jail for 10 years after the First World War because he had, uh, uh, he had declared opposition to the draft. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, so, so the, in fact, there's nothing comparable to this in the history of the West any, or in, in world history altogether. Uh, now, uh, La Prensa is described in the United States as the journal that opposed Somoza. In fact, there was a journal called La Prensa, which did oppose the Somoza regime courageously. Its editor was, in fact, murdered. And it uh, had the same name as this journal, La Prensa. Uh, and it's described as the same journal. But is that true? Well, no, it's a little tricky at this point. It certainly has the same name. Uh, in 1980, uh, the owners of La Prensa decided to convert the journal into a, government, into a, a journal dedicated to the overthrow of the government. At that point, they fired the editor, uh, the brother of the editor who had been murdered under Somoza, and there was a split in the staff. 80% of the staff left with the editor and formed a new journal, El Nuevo Diario, uh, which is the successor of the old La Prensa, at least if a newspaper is defined by its editor and its staff. Not, of course, if it's defined by the money that's behind it, supplied by the CIA, then you have a different answer to what's the old La Prensa. And that, incidentally, is also something that's never discussed. Uh, but suppose that's true. Let's suppose it's just a CIA journal, uh, and in fact that there's no parallel to it in the history of the West, all of that being true, uh, calling for the overthrow of the government, funded by the outside power, superpower, that is trying to overthrow the government. Uh, well, nevertheless, a true civil libertarian would defend La Prensa, from harassment. I think somebody who really believes in civil liberties should say, yes, England should have permitted the press to be dominated by Nazi Germany in 1942. And if they didn't do it, uh, that shows they don't believe in freedom. That's the position of a real civil libertarian. And that's the position of the American intellectual community with regard to La Prensa. Uh, and now at this point, we ask the obvious question. Is this passionate commitment to freedom of the press based on libertarian enthusiasms and passions, or is it based on service to the state? Well, there's a way of answering that question. In fact, we all know the way of answering that question. It's a question that we regularly ask, or don't even bother asking, because the answer is so obvious, uh, when we look at propaganda of our enemies. So you take a look at uh, uh, productions of, say, the World Peace Council, which is a Communist Front peace organization, or the East German uh, uh, peace committee, you know, the government peace committee. You read that material and you'll find that there's all sorts of descriptions there, uh, generally valid descriptions of crimes and atrocities and repression in the United States or committed by the United States and its agents and so on and great outrage over these uh, uh, horrors. Often that material is accurate and often, in fact, it's material that's not reported here. Well, do we praise them for their, you know, libertarian passions? No, we first ask a question. Uh, we ask, how do they deal with repression and atrocities carried out by the Soviet Union and its clients, where they are and the ones they're responsible for. Well, as soon as we get the answer to that question, we dismiss the whole story with contempt and ridicule properly, uh, even if their charges are accurate. That's a fair test, and we ought to have the honesty uh, uh, to apply the same test to ourselves, so let's do it. We now ask the same question about the defenders of liberty of press in the case of La Prensa. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the New York Review of Books, the Educated Community, and so on, the Neiman Fellows, and so on. Now, how do we test that? Well, we look at, same test, we look at cases of repression of freedom of the press in our domains, and we ask how they've reacted. And there are many such cases, very close by, in fact. So take El Salvador. El Salvador had independent newspapers at one time. Doesn't have many longer. These were not newspapers funded by a foreign power uh, trying to overthrow the government of El Salvador. They were not newspapers supporting the guerrillas. In fact, they were mildly liberal newspapers uh, calling for mild reforms, like 
land reform and things like that, raising questions about the concentration of land and so on. Those newspapers don't exist any longer. Uh, they were not censored. They were not harassed. Uh, rather, another technique was used by the government that we installed, trained, directed, uh, and armed. Uh, the technique was, in the case of one newspaper, the security forces uh, picked up an editor and a photojournalist in a San Salvador restaurant, took them outside, cut them to pieces with machetes, and left them in a ditch. The owner then fled. That took care of one newspaper without censorship. Uh, the second newspaper, it took a couple of bombing attempts, three assassination attempts. Uh, finally, the military that we train, support, and arm surrounded the premises of the newspaper, uh, entered it, smashed the place up. At that point, the editor fled. Uh, that took care of the second newspaper. So that's the end of the free press in El Salvador. Well, uh, now we ask the question, uh, where, how would, did the American press respond to this? Well, uh, that, that was actually investigated by FAIR, uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, the media monitoring organization. They checked uh, eight, I guess it was eight years of the New York Times to see what, there had been, what had been said about this. Well, it turns out there was not one word in the news columns of the New York Times about this. Uh, I, I checked the editorials. There was not one phrase in the editorials about this. In fact, the only reference to, the, the, to these two things in the New York Times was that the editor of one of the journals who fled was allowed an op-ed in which he described what had happened. Now, that's important because it means all the civil libertarians knew about it, the ones who read the New York Times, like the Neiman Fellows and the editors of the New York Review and the editors of the New York Times. They all knew about it. It just wasn't important enough to report or to comment on. Well, that tells you where the commitment to freedom of the press is. Uh, turn to the neighboring country of Guatemala. Uh, there, too, there was no censorship. Uh, they took care of freedom of the press by simply murdering uh, about 50 journalists uh, in the early 80s, including people, you know, journalists murdered uh, right when they were on radio and television announcing. Somehow that took care of freedom of the press without any censorship. Virtually no discussion, a few words here and there. Well, now this, this was a government we supported, that we supported, remember, supported enthusiastically. Uh, with that government is supposed to now be a democracy. Uh, they had an election that we all proudly hail and so on. And after the democracy was established, one of the editors who had fled uh, returned, this is last year, just a year ago, to try to open a small newspaper. Again, wasn't funded by a foreign power, you know, wasn't calling for the overthrow of the government, nothing like that, just a small, very small, limited capital sort of left liberal newspaper, La Epoca it was called. Uh, he, as soon as he came back to the country, uh, the death squads, which are just adjuncts of the security forces, uh, 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 threatened him with death if he didn't leave the country. But he continued and started up the newspaper. It uh, ran a couple of issues. Uh, then 15 armed men, surely from the security services, broke into the offices, firebombed them, destroyed the premises, kidnapped the night watchman. Uh, the editor called a press conference the next day in which he announced uh, that there, this shows that there can't be any freedom of the press in the so-called democracy of Guatemala. Uh, some members of the European press uh, came. I don't think any American reporter came. Uh, there was, uh, he, then, he then received another death threat warning him to flee the country or be killed. He did flee the country. He was taken to the airport by a Western ambassador so that he wouldn't be killed along the way, and he went back into exile in Mexico. Well, how much coverage did that one get? Uh, in the New York Times and the Washington Post, which are the two that I checked, the amount of coverage was zero, not a word about it. And it's not that they didn't know it. They did know it. And you can prove that they knew it, because if you look in the small print, uh, you'll find oblique references to it. So, for example, in the culture section of the New York Times, a couple of weeks later, there's a report uh, somebody went down to some, uh, you know, meeting in Mexico and he met this guy and he sort of refers to the facts. So they knew about it, it just wasn't important enough to report. Uh, let's take uh, the other major client of the United States, in fact, the major client of the United States, the state of Israel. That's the major subsidized country of the United States. So you want to find out what American elites think about freedom of the press? Let's take a look at the way they react to freedom of the press in Israel. Now here, history was kind enough to set up some controlled experiments for us, uh, the, literally. Uh, the week, let's go back to the week when La Prensa was suspended. Remember, right after the United States had declared war against Nicaragua, uh, as the administration said, in violation of the world court ruling, and they suspended this 
newspaper funded by the United States and calling for the overthrow of the government. Uh, well, that just right then, uh, Israel closed two newspapers in Jerusalem. Two newspapers in Jerusalem were closed permanently. Uh, it's not the first time that it happened. Uh, the case went to the Supreme Court, Israeli Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court ruled that it was legitimate to close the two newspapers because the security services had claimed that, without providing any evidence, because they don't have to, that these newspapers were funded by hostile elements, which presumably means the PLO. And the court declared, the high court declared, that no government would ever permit a business to function, however legitimate it may be, that's funded and supported by a hostile power. Uh, freedom of press, they said, exists in Israel, but it's limited uh, and is not permitted to, um, to uh, undermine the security of the state. And that's the high court. Well, how much coverage was there of those two things? Well, everybody was hysterical about La Prensa. Answer, zero. Or to be precise, there was a reference. Uh, in a letter to the Boston Globe in which I was commenting on the total hypocrisy of Harvard University and the Neiman Fellows, I mentioned it. Uh, but that, as far as I know, is the total, ref is the total references in the United States. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, the week uh, after the, uh, uh, the Central American Peace Accords went into operation, October 1987, La Prensa was opened again, and it returned to its task of calling for the overthrow of the government and so on and, so on, and identifying itself with the Contras and so on. Uh, the week that La, that La Prensa was reopened, History again ran a nice experiment for us. Uh, that week, the state of Israel closed a newspaper in Nazareth, that's inside Israel, and closed a news office in Nablus. The newspaper in Nazareth was closed because the state had again alleged, without providing any evidence, uh, that it was uh, associated with a hostile group. And uh, the court went, again went to the courts, and the courts declared that this is legitimate, uh, even though the editor had stated, which of course was true, that everything that appeared in the newspaper had gone through censorship, because they have heavy censorship. Didn't matter. Uh, the news, the uh, office in Nablus I, was closed on the same pretext, uh, you know, some connection with a hostile group. As far as I know, it never went to the courts. So how much coverage was there of those two things? Well, the usual answer, zero. Uh, I could go on, but these uh, facts show very clearly, they, they answer very clearly the first question. The concern over freedom of the press in Nicaragua is a total fraud. It does not have anything to do with concern for freedom of the press. It simply has to do with concern for serving the state. In fact, the number of people in the United States who believe in freedom of the press and who, I don't mean ordinary, of the people who write about such topics or speak about them, the number who believe in freedom of the press, I think they could easily fit in somebody's living room, or maybe in a telephone booth, in fact. Uh, and they would include virtually nobody who's gotten hysterical on this topic or even mentioned it. Uh, well, that's the kind of thing you'll discover if you look closely. I'll just give you one final example. Uh, when I talk about this topic, I like to use this morning's New York Times. And you can always find a perfectly good example there on the front page. <laughs> but today, unfortunately, I didn't have I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning in Eau Claire in a snowstorm and had to drive here. I didn't have time to find the times, so I'll have to use yesterday's. I apologize. Last one I've looked at. Uh, the lead story in the New York Times yesterday, you know, major story on the left, right-hand side of the front page, is a story entitled, U.S. Envoy Urges Hondurans to Let the Contra Stay. Uh, and then comes as the Bush administration is trying to convince Honduras to let the Contra stay there. And it goes on, and you get down to the middle of the second page, you know, the continuation page, and you find the following sentence. On its face, the administration proposal to keep the Contras in place would seem to be inconsistent with the spirit of the regional peace agreement, which calls for their relocation, but administration officials say there's no inconsistency. Okay. <laughs> that is a forthright critique of the government. <laughs> Uh, well, let's look at the facts that lie behind that. Uh, it's not that the proposal seems to be inconsistent with the spirit of the regional peace agreement. It's that it's flatly inconsistent with the wording of the regional peace agreement. And it doesn't matter which regional peace agreement you're referring to. If you're referring to the Central American Peace Accords of August 1987, 
they identify one indispensable element, they call it, for bringing peace to the region, and that's the termination of any aid, logistical, technical, propagandistic, uh, any aid whatsoever to irregular forces, uh, or uh, meaning the Contras attacking from another country. Uh, there was a more recent agreement just a couple of weeks ago in which the, pres the Central American presidents uh, committed themselves, all five of them, to remove the Contras within, to work out plans for removing the Contras within 90 days. So this is not, uh, does not seem to be inconsistent with the spirit of the agreement. Uh, it's flatly inconsistent with their precise wording. Uh, uh, the, the, and it goes on, the point goes on. Uh, there's going to be a vote in Congress about humanitarian aid to the Contras who were convincing uh, Nicaragua to leave in, uh, to Honduras to leave in Nicaragua. Uh, and the press is going to refer to this as humanitarian aid, as they've been doing all along. Well, the term humanitarian aid has a meaning. Uh, in fact, the meaning was made very precise uh, by the World Court, the highest authority uh, on such issues, in the very same judgment in which it condemned the United States for its aggression in Nicaragua. Uh, they, they defined humanitarian aid as aid which meet to, says to qualify as humanitarian aid aid must meet the hallowed purposes of the Red Cross, uh, that is, must serve civilians in need and suffering. And furthermore, to qualify as humanitarian aid, aid must be given to civilians on both sides of a conflict without discrimination. Otherwise, it just doesn't qualify as humanitarian aid. So by the ruling of the world court, and in fact, that's the standard definition, what the media call humanitarian aid isn't humanitarian aid at all. It's just military aid. It's aid to keep a military force uh, uh, in uh, present in a uh, so that they can uh, continue to pose a threat to Nicaragua. I should add, incidentally, that it's very likely that the United States is sending military aid to Contras inside Nicaragua illegally from the Ilopango Air Base in San Salvador, exactly as we'd been doing all along. Now that was that's what's called the Hassenfuss route because. It was exposed when the American mercenary Eugene Hassenfuss was shot down. Now that had been going on for years, and the media knew about it for years, and they weren't reporting it. Uh, the scandal came when they were forced to report what they had always known. And then some of the more honest of them admitted, yeah, we knew it all along, we weren't reporting it. Uh, in fact, they were being informed all along by Nicaraguan intelligence that these flights were coming. They were told how many there were, where they were, you know, they got radar sightings. It just wasn't the kind of story you report if you're a good commissar. So none of it was reported until the plane was shot down with the American mercenary and then, you know, can't stop reporting it. Uh, well, the same Nicaraguan sources that were ignored before and were accurate, as everyone concedes, are once again reporting that Nicaraguan radar is starting to pick up contra flights uh, from Ilopango Air Force Base into Nicaragua. And there's no particular reason to doubt that those reports are accurate now. But I don't think there's a single reference to these reports in the media. At least I haven't been able to find one. And it's not because they don't know it. They came across the AP wire, which means everybody knows it. And it's not that it's an obscure fact. After all, that's what the whole Iran-Contra hearings were about. It's just that a disciplined press doesn't report things like that. Now, this is a free country, so you can find out about it. Uh, all the readers of Barracada Internacional, uh, the uh, Sandinista newspaper that's put out and, you know, that's distributed from San Francisco, so that's about 1,500 people and so on, they could find out. So fortunately, you know, nice not to be in a totalitarian country, but the readers of the news, or people who happen to have access to the AP wires and read them all day, you know, they could find out. Uh, but people who are looking at the tube or reading their newspaper are not going to find out, though it's pretty important. Well, continuing with humanitarian aid, uh, there's going to be a vote on it in a couple of weeks, and probably they'll vote it. Uh, the so-called humanitarian aid that's been given uh, is in violation of the Central American agreements. It's actually even in violation of the very congressional legislation that legislated the aid. In other words, it's an internal self-contradiction which nobody will point out in the media. How does that work? It works as follows. The congressional legislation last year to give humanitarian aid stipulated that that aid must be in accord with the Central American agreements and with the ceasefire agreement that had been just settled between the Contras and the government of Nicaragua. That's the legislation. Well, that ceasefire agreement is quite explicit about the point. It says aid may be given to Contras in designated ceasefire zones inside Nicaragua 
for the purpose of relocating them and reintegrating them into uh, a Nicaraguan society. Now, that's what the, so that means the congressional, the, according to the congressional legislation, that's the only aid we can give. Furthermore, it says that the aid has to be given by a neutral car carrier. Well, Congress immediately voted to violate its own legislation that it had just passed by designating U.S. aid as the carrier. Now, by no stretch of the imagination is that neutral. In fact, it's, I don't have to bother talking about that. That's a State Department affiliate, which has often functioned as a front for the CIA. Uh, furthermore, the aid was to go to Contras in Honduras, not ceasefire zones inside Nicaragua, and to maintain them, not to assist in their relocation and reintegration in Nicaraguan society. So Congress at once voted to violate its own legislation. Uh, furthermore, the same ceasefire agreements designated a responsible authority to determine uh, how the agreements should be met. The authority was the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Secretary General Suarez, the American, of the Organization of the American States. Uh, as soon as this happened, he wrote a letter to George Shultz uh, condemning the United States for uh, carrying out this violation of the ceasefire agreement, which in fact even violated the, the uh, congressional legislation. None of this has ever been reported as far as I know. Uh, try to find it somewhere. So even the fact that, that the responsible authority at once said the aid is illegal even the fact that the congressional aid is, is violating even its own stipulations, let alone the uh, ceasefire agreement and the regional peace accord, none of this is reported, and I'll make a prediction. When the issue comes up in a couple of weeks about renewing it, you're not going to find any of this reported again. Well, that's the kind of thing you find when you look. Uh, and you find it all over the place. In fact, I think you find it near universally. I mean, it'd be hard to find uh, an exception to it. Uh, it's to be expected. That's the way you'd expect the media to function on pretty plausible assumptions. Uh, 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 let me return finally to the prediction of the propaganda model that I mentioned. However well confirmed it may be, uh, it's not going to be part of the discussion. It's going to be outside the spectrum of discussion. Be its very validity guarantees that for the reasons that I mentioned. And that conclusion, again, is quite well confirmed and one can assume with reasonable confidence that that will continue to be the case. Thanks. You've been listening to part one of Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media, a lecture presented by Professor Noam Chomsky at the Wisconsin Union Theater on the Madison campus of the University of Wisconsin on the evening of March 15, 1989. This lecture was sponsored by the Wisconsin Union Directorate's Distinguished Lecture Series for the 1988-1989 academic year. For more information about Noam Chomsky and his work, please visit the Chomsky Archive website at chomsky.info. The question and answer session from this presentation may be found in Part 2 of this program, you can find Part 2 at the PDX Justice Media Productions website at pdxjustice.org or at the PDX Justice video channels on YouTube or Vimeo. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free, on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org. And write to us with your comments and questions at pdxjustice at riseup.net. We'd love to hear from you. Many of our programs are available on DVD and Blu-ray video disc. Please write to us for ordering information. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media.